Hi, I'm James Burns, and this is when connections are magic. Uh, but it turns out this is actually when connections are not magic. Uh, when I originally wanted to give this talk, when I originally started doing work at, at, at LightStep, I was, I, I was doing research. And, and as part of that research, I wanted to, to do what was essentially public SRE. So uh, I'd previously operated systems at, at Twilio and Stitch Fix, and as part of operating those systems, we had dependencies on, on different sorts of cloud APIs, particularly storage and, and pipelines. And I saw some really interesting stuff there. I, I saw, for instance, a, a case where the aggregate error rate for a service was 0.00001%, and that took down the application I was responsible for in a particular AZ. So these, these sorts of situations where the cloud provider doesn't care about the aggregate error rate, but you care about a lot, I'd, I'd seen those, I'd experienced those. And so, but I couldn't talk about them a lot in any sort of detail. And so I thought this would be an opportunity to, to present this information, to, to write some open source and, and demonstrate some of these, these practices, not just for instrumenting, but also seeing the issues. Uh, and as part of that, I want to you know, throw out some buzzwords like observability, cloud functions, APIs. Uh, and, and so what I did was I built a, a cloud function uh, based on Go and uh, to simulate the just-in-time transformation of some data from an object store. I thought, hey, this would be sort of an interesting way to put these together. Um, so I built it out, I started getting data, and unfortunately the data didn't look quite that cool or coherent. Uh, what I saw was this. And, and I had previously thought I'd built some cross-cloud systems before, and I thought, you know, going to cross-cloud would, would be about 30% slower. What I actually saw was that it was about uh, more than twice as slow in some cases, and in other cases, it was four times slower to go cross cloud. And so, uh, so I'd backed myself into a corner of sorts. Because I'd chosen, chosen to do serverless, I didn't have any way of seeing what was actually going on with the network. Uh, normally, I'd just go onto a box and get a, get a PCAP and start looking, and all I had was actually the, the, the application interface. And so I asked myself, how can I see what's really happening and why? And so I did some research about different ways you could do this and go, and I eventually found the package HTTP trace. And what this does is it gives you callbacks um, for start, start and end time for DNS, TCP, TLS, and the, the actual HTTP request and response. So this was perfect. This had the data I needed, and so I looked for a way to integrate it into traces. Um, because I wanted to see not, not in aggregate why, why are these things being slow, but for this particular trace, which part of its interaction made it slow. And what I found was that there wasn't really a good tool out there. So in open trace and contrib, there's a Go standard lib um, that requires you to rewrite your HTTP requests. And, uh, and since I wanted to open source this, and since I didn't want to fork all the cloud SDKs and rewrite them, that wasn't going to work for me. So I kept looking for other tools that were using this, and I found that the AWS uh, X-Ray SDK used this, and it provided a really great interface for it. But it was for X-Ray and not for open tracing. But luckily, open source, Apache license. I took an afternoon, ported it to open tracing, and I had more data. The data looks sort of like this. Uh, DNS, dial, TLS, uh, request and response. And, uh, and this actually made sense, uh, what was going on. And for, for the simplest case, and to understand why it makes sense, you need to understand this diagram here. So this is uh, what's involved in, in a network transaction using TLS. So you have SYNAC, AC, SYN, SYNAC, AC for the TCP phase. You have the, the, the TLS negotiation, which actually has way more messages than fit on this screen, but you have um, two back and forth uh, round trips for that, and then you have one back and forth for the HTTP request. And I put the storage RPC on there as well because that actually becomes visible um, shortly. So the bottom line here is that you have one round trip, two round trips, and one round trip for these different phases. So if we know that, what does that actually look like in this case? What can we infer about the network latency? So we know one round trip, in this case, is 76 milliseconds. And we say two round trips, 
about 150, that looks about right. And then we look at this and we say, well, it's one round trip, which we know is probably about 75 milliseconds at this point, plus 25 milliseconds for a storage RPC. This is very interesting. So you can, you can start tracking these different sorts of parts of what's affecting your latency from the application in your traces. And then, so uh, looking at actual cases with this, I saw interesting things like this. So this is what a trace um, for cross-region with GCS looks like. And you, you look at the network latency, you're like, that looks pretty weird. But then you remember that uh, Google has local endpoints. And so the, the three round trips that have to do with negotiate connection happen locally. And then only the storage, storage RPC goes cross-regionally. And then you look at something like this. And this is what it looks like for, for S3 cross-regional. And, uh, and it's a long time. Um, and, and then think about what the AWS uh, trade-offs are and how they architect it. So they're strongly, uh, strongly regional so that every single packet, if you're going cross-regionally, every single round trip is going to go all the way between whatever two geographic areas you're doing. And to get some feel for this, here's what it looks like, US East one to EU West one. Um, and it, even that doesn't really convey it. Uh, it wasn't until I, like, I was trying to figure out how to illustrate this, I stuck my finger on the globe and I traced the distance. I'm like, yeah, that's a really long ways. Um, and so that, that's why it takes a long time. It's just, just the physics of it. Um, so that explained the differences I was seeing uh, with initial setup. But the big difference turned out to be this. So um, a lot of the time, I was seeing reuse, connection reuse. And, and so one round trip is a lot less than three round trips, especially cross-regionally. And it looked like this. And so, so that was interesting. But the, the problem, the confusion, was that it happened on the first request. And I was wondering, since this is a function, it has life cycle, how was I getting reuse on the first request? And, and so I, I spent a lot of time like, asking questions, trying to figure out with reflection inside of the thing. I, I threw up my hands and I said, it must be runtime magic that Google's doing in Google Cloud Functions. And so I, I published, uh, I published the, 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 the report and I submitted the CFP. And uh, the day after I got acceptance for this talk, I got this running in Lambda. And I learned that connections are not magic. <laughs> Uh, what I saw in Lambda was this. It looks a little bit different, but I saw reuse on the first case. And so, uh, so I had to start wondering, well, if it's not runtime magic, what might it be? And I, I thought about all the different dimensions I'd taken account of. I'd taken account of um, the different services. I'd taken account of the regions. I'd taken account of um, the, the, the different targets for the different... Uh, the, the actual storage, but it turned out what I hadn't taken account of was frequency. So um, I had been making, since it was the easiest thing to do, a bunch of requests every minute. I just used a, a cron job and made the requests. Uh, it, it turns out um, that if you re make requests more often, you get reuse um, with S3 as well. So this is, this is the, what the histogram looks like for, for S3. Um, and you can see, uh, as you get more frequent requests, uh, you, you pass that reuse threshold, and you start not having to pay the price of all those, all those connection setups again. Um, so I did that, and then I, I went back and I said, well, how slow do I need to be for it not to be reused in Google? And I got out to making one request every minute and a half, it was still seen reuse. And at that point, I did throw up my hands and say, Maybe it is magic, um, but really further research is needed, is the, is the conclusion I came to. So I, I saw um, several other interesting things that I'd like to share with you uh, as part of this process. So the first one, um, by default, when you set up a Lambda, Lambda function, it will assign it 128 megabytes of RAM. Um, and, and what I was seeing was things like this. So uh, using the same rule, of how do you, how do you look at uh, the implied network latency? Well, the dial is about, uh, for TCP is about one millisecond, and then TLS is about a second, and then the uh, HTTP is about 27 milliseconds. So if you figure uh, storage, storage RPCs, about 25 milliseconds, uh, 
everything's consistent except for TLS. And I asked a whole bunch of people, asked AWS, nobody could answer what's going on. Uh, and then I finally did some more reading and, and saw that um, CPU is throttled based on memory in Lambda. And so uh, I bumped it up to 256 megabytes. And this mostly went away. Um, and, and so I went, oh, this is CPU throttling. Uh, and that was, that was my, my original version of this answer, but then I was thinking about more, and, and I was thinking, isn't it the case that, that there's supposed to be native support for TLS uh, operations and TLS setup in most uh, CPUs now? So should it be that CPU expensive? Um, is Lambda restricting access to those, those instructions? Is it presenting something different? Still, still some open questions there. Uh, the next one I saw was GCS OAuth. So the way that GCS works, especially outside of, uh, of, of the Google Cloud, is that um, when you want to access something, you, you have a service bundle, and that service bundle includes a, a key and a certificate, and what happens is that the, the SDK uses that to reach out to an OAuth uh, endpoint that gives you back a token that then you can use um, in your actual storage endpoint. And, uh, and there's no way to extract that client to see how long it takes. So you, you end up with this, this giant amount of time where nothing's actually happening. Um, and it's a long time uh, on average. Um, it could be one round trip, it could be two round trips, it could be full setup. Um, it's not visible because of the way that this is, this is actually hidden in the SDK. Uh, so what I ended up doing is there's a S3 interop mode um, that's provided in GCS because I wanted to, to, to actually present the best possible performance here. And with that, um, with that interop mode uh, that uses HMAC key signing so that there's no back and forth, um, this basically goes away. It also goes away if you turn off off. So it's definitely OAuth, but why is it so slow? Um, that's open open question. Uh, next one. DNS latency. So in this particular case, this, this is a, a slight outlier, but not a, a major outlier. Um, this is local in Lambda, uh, accessing a local S3 bucket. And you have a DNS latency of 70, almost 78 milliseconds. Um, that's a really long time for something that should be in the same cloud right next to other things that you're constantly making requests. Um, and, and even in the, in, the, in the average case, it's 20 to 30 milliseconds for DNS. Um, somebody said, you should open a ticket with support. Um, but for, for a play thing, I probably will not get an answer. Um, and, and the other interesting thing is that uh, in, this, in Lambda, um, in USD one with all the qualifiers, um, the, the average Google DNS latency is about 15 to 20 milliseconds. So it's actually faster to ask Google for a DNS answer than it is to get one locally. Seems odd, would be nice to understand why. Um, but without knowing that, that you can track these things without looking at it, you'd just be like, oh, it's sort of slow. Uh, the last one, oh. The last one, uh, when you run in the interop mode, um, what I saw uh, was that uh, the the fetches were bimodal. So these are these are two different um, two different peaks. Um, there's nothing different in the dimensions that we can see between those peaks. So uh, they're about 30 milliseconds apart. It's a little bit hard to see with the log notation, but they all have connection reuse. They all are to the same same region. They all have the same qualifications, except um, not quite half of them, a little bit less just take 30 milliseconds longer. Again, one of these things that once you see it, um, you can start asking the right questions. So to take, take a step back and, and to try and learn from my mistakes um, and, and how this sort of went sideways for me, um, I wanna talk about how to think about observing systems. And so one of the first things you have to understand is what matters for the system. Like, is it, is it going to be latency? But it's not just, does latency matter? It's like does latency matter from what locations? Does it matter at what request rate? And what's the acceptable variance of latency? Or if it's throughput, it's with what parallelism, with what message sizes, with what variance again? 
And once you, once you have this, these sorts of things about, well, this is the kinds of things I'm trying to measure in the system, you have to figure out what perspective you want to measure them from. Because it's, it's usually not enough to have a single perspective. It's usually not enough to have the service edge. You want, you want other perspectives, so you can make sure that they're oriented towards what your users or clients or whoever else you're building this system for can see. And you, you have to start, start thinking about um, how, will these, how will these perspectives compare with each other? How will make, I make sense of them? And that, that next step is, and, and this is something that I particularly failed to do explicitly enough, is to create a mental model of what you think the moving parts of the system are going to be, and how you're going to measure them, and how you're going to specifically instrument so that you can confirm or disconfirm your mental models. As the system evolves, as you have more users, as you have different kinds of users, how will I know that, my, that what I'm thinking, what I, what I believe this does, is actually what it does? So you have to ask, what am I seeing? And this is one of those basic questions where you think you're measuring one thing, and it turns out that you're not. So what kinds of, what kinds of uh, actions can you take to try and, try and um, see if what you think you're measuring isn't what you're measuring? If you think you're measuring network-like latency for connections, what can you do to see that that's not the case? If you think you're measuring uh, client-side latency, how will you know that that's actually the case? What kinds of tests do you need? And then after, after you understand what you're seeing, then you can ask, why am I seeing it? What, what sorts of things might be causing this? If I know the, the pieces of a puzzle that I'm trying to work on, what might be causing it to do something different than what I expect? But the most important lesson for this, for me, and hopefully, hopefully what you can take away from this, is that variance happens. But it happens long dimensions. And you might not know what those dimensions are, but variance is not random. Like these are, these are fairly deterministic systems, even in their complexity. So if you see a large amount of variance and you can't understand why, there's probably a dimension that you're missing. And that, that dimension might not even be available to you. But you, you have, to, have to think about, do I have the dimensions to understand the behavior of the system? What sorts of things would I need to understand about the system to understand if the variance matters? What kinds of things would I need to investigate to, to, to create these, the, these updates to my model or to update my observability? Which of these things needs to change? Because sometimes, sometimes it is magic, but most of the time uh, our job is to dig further into, the, in, into what looks like magic and try and break these things down so that we can ex expose those different pieces of information to people who are using our systems or ourselves as users. The other important part of this is that it's important to, it's important to expose to your users the uncertainty and, and to keep that fresh because there's, there's always going to be something that you can't see. There's always going to be something that's not clear. And if people are certain that things mean a certain way, that the measurement absolutely means this, then they can make decisions that can, that can take your, your system off the rails. So, so keeping that uncertainty fresh, my favorite method is to use chaos ex exercises, but there are lots of different ways to, to make sure that you're uh, exposing that to, to your users as well. So I'd like to leave you with, with, uh, with an exercise, uh, uh, something to imagine, uh, a direction. So imagine if you could look at the health of a critical cloud service API uh, dependency across all your services the same way. Imagine if you could have the variance that matters built into your cloud SDKs. Imagine if you could compare the health you're seeing from these APIs with trusted other users of those APIs instead of trying to back channel to your friends in Slack or searching Twitter. Imagine a real status page that reflects actual use along the dimensions that matter. So this is my next project that I'm working on. How do we collect the information in the same way so that, so that you don't have to ask, is it just me? Or you don't have to ask, is it just this, this service? How can we take the opportunity that open telemetry provides us to rethink the way we're instrumenting these critical dependencies 
And if you want, if you want to collaborate with us, if you want to complete, compete with us, uh, let's figure out how to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, James Burns. Do we have any questions in the audience? Questions before lunch? Uh, Mr. Chris. Hey, great talk, thank you. Um, I'm curious if you ever got a backend trace either from GCP or AWS that, that shows what was happening with DNS resolution or in the request response cycle? Sorry, I, I can't. Uh, if, you, if you ever got a backend trace, because you mentioned that you might have talked to uh, support for GCP or AWS. I'm curious what, what else is happening on the back end, maybe that they're tracing that you can't see. Yeah, um, so I was not able to get anybody since I wasn't paying enough money to actually answer questions about what was happening. Um, one of the interesting opportunities I think exists, though, is that... Um, there was a presentation that I recently saw about how AWS does their failure domains um, by cells, and that, so that's how they provide the personalized dashboard. Um, it would be really interesting if they provided the failure domain back in response headers, so we could tag our stuff up, up that way, and if, if Google did something similar. Um, Basically, it seems, uh, in my previous experience dealing with support teams, that it's, it's totally decoupled. Like, you, you send them a graph, and you send them dimensions, and then they go talk to some other people, and they pull their equivalent graph. Um, but it's, it's, it would sure be nice to be able to, to, to have even an anonymized version of their backend graph, but that is not something that I've found anybody who's interested in doing yet, um, unfortunately. Question. Any more? One more over there. And then it will be time for lunch. Great talk. Thank you very much. Um, so you talked a little bit about being kind of blind to certain things underneath the hood due to lack of instrumentation. Have you ever used, and you mentioned using chaos engineering a little bit to get at the truth. Can you talk about an example of something like that where you suspect something's true, and then you can go in and create a test, some, some kind of game day experiment um, that validated or invalidated your kind of hypothesis? Yeah, so, uh, so one, of the, one of the very basic things, and maybe it, it's too basic to, to say, but uh, one of the things, when uh, the, one of the systems I was working at Twilio, we, we built it out and we'd, we thought we'd had observability, and then what we started doing is we removed capacity. And we figured out that we weren't actually looking at any of the end-to-end -end metrics uh, from a business-centric way. And so removing capacity, we knew we'd remove capacity. We couldn't see that we'd remove capacity. Um, that meant that we weren't actually looking at uh, the, the things that mattered. In another case, uh, same kind of thing where we just uh, started injecting network latency to, to one set of the endpoints. Real problem that can happen. Some, some set of the things you depend on get slow absolutely invisible because we weren't, we weren't um, separating out the way we looked at, uh, at, the, uh, at the metrics and, and traces in a way that would, would allow us to root cause that kind of issue. So even simple things like removing capacity or injecting latency can, can surface those kind of gaps. Very cool, awesome, thank you. Okay. All right, I think it is time for lunch. So everyone, Go eat, have fun, it's all in the back. <laughs>